we will be dealing about ethno-veterinary medicine as a viable alternative for livestock and poultry therapy with the use of not only herbal medicines, but also other alternative uh, medication to at least lessen the use of antimicrobials in the farm. The outline for our topic today uh, would be talking first on the identification, collection, and preparation of medicinal plants. And these are the simple guidelines that we have to follow in order to maximize the ingredients that we will be using for the preparation of our medications, herbal medications. And uh, there are actually very, very numerous types of medicinal plants that we have here in the Philippines. We have tens of thousands. And I have given just a few examples of which we can use for our medication. The third part would be on the different processes on uh, medicinal plants. Okay, And this would be something that we can do ourselves in our home, provided we have the necessary materials. And lastly, the many ways that we have, we can apply these different herbal preparations that we have done in medicating our animals. What's being shown here on the other side of the slide are the four publications of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization way back in 1980s, but are still very functional, are still very useful even up to now because these are just you know, simple ways on how to prepare the different um, herbal medicines that we can use. Uh, we have the general information, the first publication, and then we have the second installation of the book focusing on ruminants, and we have the third on swine, and we have the fourth in poultry. Ethno-veterinary medicine is not only famous and being practiced here in Asia, uh, but that's also being uh, notably practiced as well in North America. Uh, we have a few publications on uh, this particular practice already. Uh, this one in British Columbia, and uh, they have uh, several also diseases that they have uh, medicated in ruminants. Other ones that uh, are found available online uh, but not on open access are veterinary herbal medicine uh, with the practice in um, also in North America. And we have ethno-veterinary bot botanical medicine, not only catering on food animals but also on small animals. Okay, so it's not only that this type of practice is being recognized only in this part of the world, but also even for those that are heavily practicing Western medicine. Of course, here in our continent, uh, this is where ethno-veterinary started. And uh, we, this is very much practiced for several centuries already in China. Even so, they, that's why they have a specific term for it, no? and they call it the Chinese traditional medicine or traditional Chinese medicine instead. That's DCM. And we also uh, have this wide practice of ethno-veterinary medicine in, Asia, in India, okay? Uh, and uh, their neighboring countries, of course, we have Nepal, Pakistan, etc. okay? And uh, for India, particularly, they call it Ayurveda medicine, okay? So they have a specific term for that as well. Um, and we have this practice uh, for centuries, no? And I'm sure that um, you have learned from your ancestors as well on how to treat, you know, simple diseases like cough. And um, I experienced it myself when I gave birth. So I underwent that cleansing with, I think, 11 types of leaves, okay? Uh, they boil the leaves, and then that's uh, what I use for my first bath, okay? Which is, I think it was a month after, but honestly, I couldn't take it. I cannot remember uh, how many days I was able to really prolong taking that first bath. I can't remember anymore. Okay, and um, Africa, okay, also practices ethno-veterinary medicine, okay, you would imagine they do not have much access on the uh, 
uh, commercial medicines. Uh, that's why, and they are very rich, of course, with these natural resources. So that's why uh, we cannot uh, ignore them or not put them aside. That they are also, of course, wide practitioners of ethno veterinary medicine. Fortunately, for this yellow book here entitled Traditional Ethno Veterinary Medicine in East Africa, this is available online for free. So you can access it. Just Google the title and then you can have a PDF form or format that you can download easily. Okay. Um, the, the diseases in this book are mostly exotic diseases because they are not present here in the Philippines, but they are widely present there, of course, in Africa. And uh, you can at least scan and review you know, the, the different uh, types of, of plants and uh, traditional ways on how to medicate uh, the, the, their different uh, diseases there in, in East Africa. Okay, it's just amazing that they are already quite organized, you know, in having all this type of medications, not having to use commercial medicine. So amazing, okay? And aside from that, they also have this publication, Innovative Ethno-Veterinary Practices in the Control of Newcastle Disease and Helminthosis in Poultry in Southwestern Uganda. Okay, so not only on ruminants, but they also have this publication as well in poultry. Now we go straight to the identification, collection, and preparation of medicinal plants. Okay, let's try to review your botany first. Uh, we have to identify uh, the plant type that uh, we want to use or we need, okay, for our uh, desired medication preparation, okay. Um, each of the plant, okay, have a particular level of concentration on the parts, okay. So it could be that if you are after saponin, okay, which is uh, one of the active ingredient of a particular plant, uh, it, uh, you have to do your research prior to your field work, prior to your collection, so that you will know if you will need to have or you would need to collect more of the leaves rather than the bark or the root, okay? So that's very important. So you don't need to take all, okay? The principle that we follow when we are going to do this field collection is to only get, get what we need and to leave the others to the other parts, okay? And then the other plants to the others who may be in need, okay? So bear in mind that we are actually the visitors of this rainforest that uh, where we go to to collect these uh, medicinal plants and the uh, environment, of course, the biodiversity surrounding uh, the rainforest or in the rainforest, okay, would be in much need of the other plants uh, found there in that location, okay? Um, going back on the plant type, uh, you have to know prior to your field work if the type of, if the plant you are looking for is either a tree a shrub, a vine, or a grass, okay? So that will save you so much of your time and resources, okay? You would have to go directly to the field and uh, immediately identify, okay, the plant that you need, okay? Not having to uh, linger or loiter in the location and uh, looking for incorrect plants, okay, for your collection. Factors that would uh, affect our collection would be the plant part, okay, the stage of growth. Commonly, we would be needing the young, okay, versus the old ones. So sometimes uh, it depends on the plant, but uh, the old or, or like the 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 middle part of the growth, okay, would be the more appropriate okay, type of uh, plant to collect rather than the old ones or like the those that are already wilting. Okay? For seasonal growth, uh, usually it's at the uh, middle part of the season would be the better time to 
collect the samples rather than on the last part, okay? Because for um, in terms of um, supplementation, soil supplementation, okay, the soil will be richer if uh, the harvest would be on the first part and then to the middle part rather than on the last part, especially if you are talking about ratoons. So we have several plants there or crops, okay, that you would uh, have several ratoons before you need to replant again. And so the nutrients in the soil will be more depleted if you would be collecting from the third ratoon as compared to the second and then the first ratoon, okay? So it's kind of related to that. The fourth uh, number here would be on the method of a uh, handling drain collection. Of course, you would have to prepare or don your PPE and use your scissors, okay, the appropriate scissors, collective record now for this, so that you would not have to destroy the uh, plant or plant part that you would be collecting, okay? Especially for the leaves, okay? As much as possible, they have to be intact. Uh, number five so would be the physical condition of its collection place. Of course, ideally, it's dry, okay? Um, not, it's not something that uh, you would go to the field to collect after a typhoon or, or something like that, okay? So ideally, it should be um, as uh, uh, like neat or organized as much as possible. And one of the very important factors would be the storage, okay? So all of your efforts will be down the drain if you do not have proper storage for your collected materials. You, you are aiming for the longer longevity of your uh, collected materials so that you don't have to go back to the place, to wherever, like rainforest, especially if it's a very rare medicinal plant that you have to go up the mountains in like in, in Baguio or like in Benguet to collect it. So it takes a lot more of the time, effort, and resources to uh, go to that trip again. So that's why you have to plan the storage facility properly. And uh, we, um, and the, of course, that includes, you know, having to prepare clean and dry uh, containers to put your collected plants, okay, and good enough that they will be safe while in transit going back to your laboratory, to your facility, or to your institute. These are, again, additional guidelines on when to collect, okay, your medicinal plant, okay? Um, we have here also additional information. Leaves and stems are best collected during the daytime, okay, or when the plant is about to bloom. So, it's, this is what we call the, um, the crack of dawn, okay? When it's not too hot yet, okay? And uh, this serves for two purposes. For the collector, so he will not uh, experience any heat stroke, okay? Imagine you're trying to collect under the heat of the sun at noon time, okay? That's very difficult for the hand here. And um, the second one would be, it's during this crack of dawn, okay, or like very, very early in the morning, uh, that the buds would start to open up, okay? So it's when they start to bloom, and it's at this time that the active, in the level or concentration of the active ingredient is higher in this type of uh, plant, okay, in the stage of the plant when they are still very young and about to bloom. Okay, as compared to that when they are already more mature. Okay, second, uh, aromatic flowers are best collected when they are flower buds, okay? So in, not in all type of plants when you want them to, uh, to collect them when they're already bloomed out, okay? But for several of the aromatic flowers, uh, you prefer or it would be better to collect them when they're just in their flower buds, okay? Not yet quite bloomed. Okay, and not unless stated, okay, not unless stated, the fruits to be collected should have ripe seeds, okay? i uh, sorry, should already be ripe, and that is when the seeds are more viable for collection and extraction of the active ingredients, okay? So if you are going to collect from a fruit that doesn't have any seed, okay, um, that special case, 
Uh, it's also better to collect them when they're already ripe because it's when the active ingredients are also in the highest level, okay? As compared to when they are uh, still raw, okay? Most commonly, that's the case, okay? Not unless stated in uh, your research procedure. Okay, I already mentioned about number one. Then we proceed to number two. Bark should be collected when the plants are in bloom or in vigorous growth, okay? Uh, they should be collected from chunks and branches. So basically, the mature trees would have the barks. And uh, it is when uh, they are mature that you can easily remove the bark, okay? As compared when they are still young, uh, they have not really developed this bark that you can easily peel off, okay? And from this bark, since they are already mature, you can expect that you already have the high level of active ingredients that you can extract from it. And um, of course, uh, we would want the plants to have established root system first before we can collect their roots, okay? Ideally, we do not remove the plant if it's at all possible to only collect a few of the roots so that the plant can still continue to thrive and to live, okay? With the remaining parts of the plant that uh, you have taken from, okay? And um, as when these plants are also mature, we can expect that their roots are established. Therefore, the level of concentration of the active ingredients would also be high. Okay, so these are the reasons behind that. This would now be the process on how to go about with the collection. After collecting, the step that we would be doing would be sorting and cleaning, okay? And the important step that we should also do at this point is to lay them, label them, okay? Uh, for novice uh, researchers okay, or collectors, they may find difficulty in trying to identify very, very similar types of plants. Okay, that's why it's always good to have your uh marking pen, you have your uh, identification tape or la la label so that they won't get mixed up in transit, okay? So um, deal with your samples as precious items, okay? Because you spent your time resources, okay, in collecting them. You have to sort them so that uh, there would be no... Uh, combination because you never know probably you know uh, you have two plants that would be neutralizing themselves okay the the effect would be to just neutralizing each other so you you then not get the effect that you want coming from these plants okay so that's why you have to sort them and label them properly and you can expect that especially if you have taken roots, they are dirty, full of soil. That's why you have to clean them and dry them, okay, so that they would not get any fungal contamination while in storage or even just in transit. The next step would be for cutting, trimming, grinding, and chopping. So this will be like the first part of processing it. Uh, it could be that you have collected like humongous parts of the plant, for example, banana leaves, okay? So it's difficult to transport them to wherever, okay? Especially if you don't have uh, the appropriate vehicle to transport these banana leaves. So then you can revert into cutting, trimming, grinding, chopping them, even during transit, okay? And um, if ever you have the appropriate vehicle to transport them intact, then you do this cutting, shaming, grinding, chopping already in your laboratory or in your facility or in your home, okay? It doesn't have to be fancy. You can do all these things at home as well. And um, it makes it then easier to dry, okay, as when your collected materials are already chopped, okay, because more surface area will be exposed to the air, 
And it is at this uh, dry state that the storage would be prolonged, okay? They would not be prone into moisture, increased moisture leading to possible contamination, especially like with molds, with fungus, and etc. And the last stage would be for the storage, okay? Ideally, um, if we were able to dry them properly, they would be stored for several months to several years, okay? Depending on the type of uh, drying that we did for our collected samples. Okay, to discuss more or elaborate further on each of the steps, uh, in order to sort and clean, okay, we have to use running water in removing the physical debris, okay, especially the soil. Ideally, we would not be using any plants with pesticides, but if we don't have a choice, we have to clean them properly. Okay, additional rounds of cleaning on moving water. For example, if without pesticides, we can do, uh, do away with two rounds of cleaning with running water. But with pesticides, okay, we have to clean it more, like three to four times more um, with uh, running water, okay? We will be doing two types of processing for our collected materials. Uh, we can use this, um, we call this the grinder, okay? We call this the grinder. And the finished product out of this uh, grinder would be still a little coarse, okay? It's not very fine yet. Okay, um, a little bit of um, increased surface area. And uh, then we revert to the second step in which we can now have the powder form as its end product, okay? The reasons for doing this type of processing is, as mentioned previously, to increase the surface area easier, make, to make it easier for drying. Okay, that's already number four. Okay, now, um, now that we have the smaller particles, if in case we will subject them into hot water or whatever extraction process, we, can, we could then be able to get more okay, easily of these active ingredients out of our sample. And if, then if we have higher level of active ingredients, then we can expect that it increases the efficacy of the plant materials, okay, or the medicinal plants. And number two is quite related to number one already, and that was discussed or uh, elaborated just a while ago, okay? Number three, okay, this only goes to some special types of plants. For example, we have, um, we have cassava, okay? Cassava is known to have uh, cyanide, okay? If we do not process them and eat them fresh, okay? That's why we have, they have to undergo processing first. Uh, commonly, to eliminate the cyanide, we have to aerate them. Okay, um, that's why um, part of like if we have to cook uh, a snack out of cassava, we have to fry them, no? You know, one of our snacks is we fry the cassava. So it's not really the frying per se, but it's on the aeration, okay? That also happens. It's um, removing the peel, okay? And then cleaning and then chopping and then drying. And when you fry them, okay, you're also somewhat uh, aerating, okay, the cassava during the process. So it eliminates or it reduces the cyanide, okay, the toxin that can be in the cassava. So then it becomes edible to both humans and then animals, okay? So peeling, honestly, it's not uh, really a process or a step that can lessen the toxicity of the cassava. Um, I have... Um, seen uh, instances or have experienced that uh, some of the cassava doesn't have to be peeled anymore. So we just go to cleaning it and then cutting it, aerating it, okay, then 
uh, it becomes a good feed to animals, okay? And the fifth one would be uh, making the plant material more convenient to store, okay? Uh, that's related to what I mentioned earlier. When, when you have to cut the banana leaf, it makes it more convenient to transport as well, okay? Transport and like have this temporary storage so that you can uh, easily bring this used to be a big banana trunk or leaf uh, down to your where you are going to do your preparation, okay? Imagine if you are going to store an intact banana leaf, okay, in your cabinet. So it, it becomes difficult. So we have to cut them into small pieces and easily they can fit into our containers, okay, smaller containers, and they can be organized in our cabinet, okay? We have two types of drying, okay? We have air drying and then we have oven drying. Of course, the simplest one would be the air drying and it becomes also the cheapest because we're just using the air, okay? And uh, the limitation to this if, is if we are in the rainy season. So we, the humid will be, humidity, okay? The moisture will be too high so that it affects the drying process, okay? It prolongs and then the, um, the, I mean, uh, I mean, the time, okay, to be able to arrive at the most dried state is affected, okay? When you're trying to dry this moist materials or this wet, uh, collect, uh, I mean, wet plants, okay? Your aim is to dry them as soon as possible so that they would not be contaminated with these uh, molds or fungus, okay? And if you are in the rainy season, of course, that prolongs that process, okay? And then if you have the capacity, you revert to oven drying, especially during the rainy season when you cannot attain, okay, the best air drying parameters, okay, to do your cheaper way of drying your materials. The trade-off with doing oven drying is uh, you can kill, Okay, you can destroy, you can kill the active ingredients or destroy your plant materials if you are drying them at very high temperatures. Okay, so that's why you have to be very particular that your machine or your oven is properly working. And uh, you can monitor the temperature with the thermostat. Okay, and one of the uh, tips in order to have an even distribution of the heat is to thinly, okay, spread them over your pans, okay, or over an old newspaper, a bamboo mat, so the heat would not be directly, okay, on your materials. So if it's at a spot possible to do that, that would be better, okay. Um, if you are Okay, number three, okay, that's already uh, part of the discussion earlier. And we now arrive to the last stage, which is on the storage. We have also different types of storage. The most common one would be the dry storage. And this, your materials would remain active for several years, provided that uh, they remain clean. Uh, they were not exposed to too much sunlight. So you see that in several labels of our containers, okay, of things that we buy from the grocery to prolong the longevity of uh, the product that we bought, it, we are advised to keep it in a dry, cool place, okay? Always remember to also label, okay, your containers. And uh, the two basic information that we put in our label would be the name, okay, of the material that we put inside our container and also the like the manufacturing date okay for the name okay you have a choice to put a code okay or a layman's term or a scientific name uh, for the material that you have stored okay The one important uh, guideline that you have to start with to have this proper dry storage, your container should be aseptic, okay? Uh, they 
should have been sterilized prior and dried properly before you use them. And we, they have to have proper cover, okay? That will provide that airtight storage so that uh, no moisture or excessive air would be coming inside that's contaminating your samples, okay? The next type of storage is the fresh storage, okay? So you wouldn't think that this is possible, okay? Because the moisture is high. Um, it This is only possible with the use of your preservative, okay? And this preservative comes with it comes in the form of a honey, okay? So it's not a chemical preservative. It's more like a natural preservative. So the air, the honey, okay, uh, encloses or encapsulates your fresh material, your plant. So no air would come through it, okay? No other moisture would come through it as well, thus preserving your fresh material. But we cannot expect much that this can last to several years. So this can only last as, as two, six months, okay? So it depends on also the plant that you try to store. So some can be only up to three months as well. The third one would be on the liquid storage. So the step that you would need is to make your decoction first, and then you mix it with uh, natural preservatives such as the castor oil, okay? And uh, for the tinctures, we also have this quite famous. We have several of our moms already uh, into aromatherapy. So they have this very concentrated alcoholic extracts of the several herbs, okay? And um, they would give off very strong aroma or some good smell, okay? And that's needed to, uh, you know, increase the calmness, okay, reduce the stress in the household, etc. And uh, this is very quite famous now, okay. And you can see this in several of the households already. So the the concept is the same. Um, for the decoctions, uh, this can only last mostly up to three months. And for the tinctures, it could last at least six years. Okay, so I. Also have a few of the bottles and they have with me, they have been with me for quite a few years now and they're still good. Okay. Now we proceed to the different medicinal plants. I think this is uh, 36 of tens of thousands that uh, we have at least here in the Philippines, okay? Makabuhay. So for makabuhay, um, we use the bark, okay? Not necessarily the plant. And makabuhay is actually known to be an abortifacient. And uh, with uh, several of the lectures that I also did pre-pandemic, so they were face-to-face -face trainings, uh, I learned that this is also being done, uh, being used as an eye drop, okay? And uh, I can remember from before, I think when I, was, uh, when I was small or also from a story from another person, that uh, they were also using it as a tooth drop, okay? Something to relieve of the pain. So it's basically one of the purposes of having that makabuhay, usually through a decoction, okay? Um, true enough, the medicinal uses could be for fever, inappetence, and also as a urine laxative. Second, we have iba or kalamyas. Um, uh, most notably, okay, this the fruit is very high for uh, high in vitamin C. That's why the medicinal uses would include those for respiratory ailments, okay, such as cough with phlegm, okay, that's productive cough, uh, gastric ulcers, and then for constipation. So we have uh, listed here the different types or parts of the plant that you will need and the different uh, active ingredients that you will be getting from these different plant parts, okay? Next, we have snake grass, okay? Snake grass is actually not endemic in the Philippines, but we see it several already. We see several of this in plant shows, okay, pre-pandemic, and this, uh, they came from Thailand and then Malaysia, okay? But more and more that you see this snake grass now. And... Um, 
the medicinal use would be on diarrhea, on skin rashes, insect and snake bites, and the simple, okay, herpes simplex virus lesions. So these can be applied topically, okay, or for the diarrhea, of course, as a decoction that we can give to our animals orally. Next is the granado or pomegranate, okay? We don't have so much of this tree here in South Luzon, but we have uh, several in the north, okay? And I think also in Mindanao, they have this. This is very, very famous in Thailand. It's one of the street fruits that I always see. And um, we have extracts of pomegranate being incorporated in the beauty products, okay? So seldom that you see them, diba? there's this famous brand, let's say Palmolive, okay, uh, that have that would have their products with pomegranate extracts for the shampoo, for the um, for the soaps, okay. And true enough, because um, they have good active ingredients, okay, rich in minerals, okay, and vitamins as well. That's why they are good for the skin. Aside from that, they can be used as a laxative uh, to relieve of the fever and uh, also for uh, a medic for treating uh, respiratory infections as well. Number five, we have the Surinam cherry. So this is not present in the Philippines. Where can where can this be located? It's in Surinam, okay, in in Africa. Um, it looks like to me as like aratilis, okay? So it's not related to aratilis. It's just like for me, so I can easily identify and memorize how it looks like. So I have, you know, uh, tried to relate it with aratilis. So that, that's just my, you know, personal take on that. Um, the medicinal use would be on diarrhea and also for mouth sores, okay? I'm not just very sure, but I will think that... Uh, uh, we can use this for or okay, but we don't have this here in the Philippines, okay? Mouth source or for our ruminants, especially our small ruminants. Number six is guava. This is the most used, okay, um, herbal plant here in the Philippines. It has several indications. Uh, I have used this, commonly I use this for uh, our diarrhea cases, uh, especially, uh, I really don't want to use a lot of antibiotics at the farm. So we really uh, do the decoction for these guava leaves, and then uh, we give them orally to our diarrhea patients, okay? And all stages, they can be piglets, winners, or even the grown ones. Of course, not only the pigs, we also have the luminance okay, where we use this. Aside from for diarrhea, we also use the decoction to treat metritis, okay? Because it has high levels of antibacterial active ingredients. And um, true enough, okay, we can also use this for uh, thrush, polyuria, and uh, some traumatic injuries, okay? Number seven is castor oil plant, okay? When you try to through these leaves, okay, it's actually very bitter. So it's difficult to feed orally to your uh, animals, to your sick animals. But as mentioned earlier, the castor oil is a good preservative for our fresh storage, okay? It is being used as a dewormer and um, also for a topical medication of uh, wounds or injuries. Next, we have candy candilaan uh, or the blue vervain. Okay, this is something that we see uh, probably as um, in our backyard, okay, or in idle lots. Okay, this is something that we usually ignore, but um, it's a good herbal plant. And uh, we commonly use this for genital urinary infection. So we have UTI and then urinary tract stones. And um, this is good also for metritis and also for um, treating against uh, hepatitis A. Okay. Although I have not used this blue vervain yet, but I see this in 
uh, several of the farms that I go to, sometimes we just remove it because we don't know the uh, the purpose of this type of plant. Okay. Number six is the West Indian M or the Bay Cedar. We don't have this. This is located in South and Central America, in the Caribbean or in Mexico. It looks like our the leaves of our mulberry tree, okay? But um, they're not uh, actually very related. Uh, but we make use of this type of plant uh, for their tannins and for their uh, flavonoids, carotenoids, etc. okay? Uh, we commonly use this to alleviate diarrhea and also flatulence. Tent is too hot, okay? So we have this. Because of the dark color, we can expect that there is a high level of antioxidant, okay? Uh, we don't have much medicinal use for this other than for gastrointestinal, and that is of diarrhea and then abdominal pain, okay? Eleven is malungay. Okay, this is very famous for lactating individuals, not only humans but for animals alike, okay? Um, aside from trying to increase the milk production, we can expect high levels of vitamin A with malunggay. That's why it's very good for uh, night blindness, eye pain, okay? Uh, and then uh, UTI as well, okay? I have not really used this as a dewormer, but it can be also used for intestinal worms. Number 12 is Acapulco. This is also very famous as a topical medicinal plant, okay? This, I would say, would be the number one when it comes to treating skin fungus, ringworms, and scabies. So we can do um, a poultice out of it, okay? And then that's the one that we can have for our topical application of such skin diseases. And this is already available commercially and you would see them as soaps or also other as ointment with Acapulco extracts, okay? Being used for human and veterinary purposes as well. Number 13 is turmeric, okay? This is quite getting a clamor right now in the veterinary world because several of the um, folks, no, farm folks would say, or even breeders, small animal breeders would say that um, they are treating whatever disease with turmeric and it's effective, okay? So it's really difficult to claim that at this point. Um, but true enough, uh, the notable indications for using turmeric would be gastrointestinal, for gastrointestinal ailments, okay? We have um, diarrhea, okay, or dysentery. Uh, we can also use this for uh, metritis or vaginitis. And then for typhoid fever, but that's mostly for humans, okay? Um, because of the color, the rich orange color, it's of course very rich in beta carotene. We have aloe vera, and we are seeing several skin products as well being used for humans with aloe vera extracts, okay? Um, when you are trying to harvest aloe vera, you get one leaf, you peel it off, and the gel inside would be the one that you will use commonly. And we can use it as a dewormer and also as something to uh, put in our wounds, okay, as topical medication. And uh, the gel inside would be very rich, okay, the, uh, the gel. Uh, would have this very rich lubrication that would moisturize your skin, okay? For if you have fresh wounds or if you have dry skin because of the burns, etc. Especially eczema. Eczema is a severe skin condition indicated with uh, dry skin and very itchy skin, okay? Uh, and um, the aloe vera extract, okay, and the gel inside will very much help in the lubrication and the moist, uh, giving the moisture and the nutrients needed by your affected skin. Okay. Number 15, we have the God's Crown. Uh, this is not present here in the Philippines, but this is one of the most common uh, medicinal plant being used in Malaysia and Indonesia. Okay, quite close to what we are using guava here, okay? 
And we use the rind and the flesh for diarrhea as well. And we can also use the leaves and the seeds for eczema and hives. So eczema and hives are too um, heavy or like severe skin conditions. 16, we have mangosteen. Again, because of the dark color, we can expect a high level of antioxidants from this fruit. Okay, And we use the saponins, polyphenols, and flavonoids from the roots and the barks. And the indications for such would be uh, dysentery. Okay, For the roots, we have diarrhea. For the leaves, we have for fever. And for the rind, we have several more aside from diarrhea. So we can have genital urinary infections as well. For the noni, okay, during my time when I was growing up in the 1990s, it became a fad, okay? Noni is said to be cure all, even cancer, okay? Um, we cannot really claim that it's cure all, but at least we can say that it's good for respiratory infections, okay? It is indeed a medicinal plant, but um, we cannot attest to the early claims that it can cure even cancer. There was a time during the 1990s that this was being sold at a very, very high price. And now, no, you don't hear anything about it. Number 18 is Gale of the Wind. So this is more like a weed again, which we may be ignoring and even um, stepping over stepping on okay while we walk in uh, going to wherever no on the farm or beside the road the street road etc um this has medicinal uses okay we can use it as a uh, dewormer and um, as a urine laxative it's good for alleviating the fever and also for increasing the resistance or immune system of the animals okay number number 19 pandan is just quite simple because of the flavonoids the aroma coming from the leaves okay it could entice the sick patient to eat more so that's basically uh, one of the indications for using pandan okay so it's uh, it becomes appetizing the food that we are giving to the sick patient who is, of course, in appetite, would now be enticed to eat because of the aroma of the pandan, okay? Number 20 is botucola. So this is famous as an anti alzheimer plant, okay? Um, I tried to, to eat this. No, it doesn't really taste anything. It's okay? just a typical, typical taste of a plant. No? It doesn't taste anything. So it is said to... Uh, be an anti-tumor and um, also uh, it can also help uh, decrease the level of fever. Okay, I know someone, Dr. Babylonia of uh, Rosario Batangas, who eats gotukole every day fresh. Parang it's, it's, it's been served to him as a, a fresh salad. Okay, and he said he comes from a family with Alzheimer's, so that's why this is one of his precautions so that he will not get Alzheimer's, hopefully not in his lifetime. Number 21, Serpentina. Okay, this is a very powerful medicinal plant. It has several indications. Okay, see, even whooping cough and tuberculosis. Okay, although I have not uh, really come across uh, literature research on, on using her Serpentina for tuberculosis. Uh, but uh, for food poisoning against mushroom, cassava, and seafood, you can use serpentina. If you buy this, this is actually expensive as a, a live plant or as uh, or in the powdered form because it has uh, very it has several indication and it's a strong medicinal plant, a powerful medicinal plant. It's very active ingredients. Twenty two is sambong. Okay. Um, more and more people are uh, now being acquainted with the use of sambong as uh, something that we can use for genital urinary infections. Okay. Um, aside from that, we can also use this for dysentery, okay, also for fever and cough. Um, we now see several veterinary commercial products that would have extracts of sambong uh, to cure of uh, kidney ailments as well. Okay. Number 23, we have the flaxweed, Indian help, etc. 
and uh, we use the leaves okay such for topical ailments okay for our wounds itchy skin ulcers eczema as well okay so we have hives and the roots we can use for thrush okay that's the fungal infection that we can have for our poultry and for our horses and also for venomous insect stings Number 24, we have the battle. Locally, we call this as the nana, nganga. Sorry, we call this as the nganga. Um, and uh, we can use this nganga for our um, eczema, uh, other skin, in, uh, skin infections as well. And uh, we can also use this for bronchitis, and uh, vaginal discharge um, indicative of nephritis. Okay, there are two types of battle. We have the typical green battle and then we have the red battle. And we can expect a little bit more higher level of antioxidants with the red battle. That's why in the medicinal and indications, uh, we have more ailments that uh, where we can use the red battle. Number 26 is our sap, okay? We call this guayabano or guayabano. And the medicinal uses would be more on the urinary bladder pain and the gastric ulcer pain, okay? So not many medicinal indications. 27, we have dila dila. This is um, also something that we may see in our uh, property, in our farm, okay? Here in Betangas, I, I see this quite often, the farms that I go to, and we quite ignore them, okay? But amazing that they are also herbal plants, okay? So ideally, we do not remove them in our property because we'll never know when we need it. We can use it for um, alleviation of fever as well, for eye inflammation, diarrhea, okay, and then cough. 28, we have the wild ginger, okay? This is the local ginger. We see that it is more colored orange than yellow. And so this is a higher in beta carotene as, compo as compared to the generic ginger, the common uh, ginger that we see. The medicinal indications would include a cystitis or kidney inflammation. We also have a constipation. And uh, it can help in the increase in the milk production as well. 29, we are nearing towards the end. So this is lentin. Um, this is uh, common in, uh, in the Quezon province, okay? Like in, in areas in Lukban and uh, nearby provinces. I do not see much of this here in Batangas, okay? But it's something that we may also be ignoring that are just widely growing in our farm or property. And we can use this for several of the genitourinary genito uh, diseases, such as UTI, gallstones, and kidney stones. 30 is the soya, which is a shrub that is an insect repellent. Okay, So we can also use this to relieve of fever caused by malaria. And the leaf can be to also alleviate fever and to reduce the pain of the headache. Okay, that's it for our a few examples of the medicinal plants. Okay, now we go to the preparation of our medicinal uh, medicinal plants. Okay, first off, okay, we have to be familiar with the common units of measurement. And you will never know, probably you'd have a chance to immerse yourself in a local community doesn't really have access to our more accurate ways of measurement. So that's why you have, it's better for you to be familiar with um, this measurement, hand measurements, okay? I've been working with uh, farms for several years now and knowing this actually comes in handy because several of the farm hands would just feed uh, or give off uh, materials by their hand, okay? So it's nice to know this and to teach them so that they can have at least, you know, a uh, good quantification or estimation of the amount that they're giving off the animals, okay? 
um, if you would be filling up one matchbox, that's about 50 grams. If you'd be filling up a small portion of your palm only, okay, at the middle of your palm, that's five grams. And uh, up to, if you fill your palm, okay, with the uh, feed material up to the tip of your fingers, okay, coming from the base of your palm, like with a good hip, that's probably, that's mostly 50 grams, okay? For peanuts, okay, if you have to give peanuts, 20 pieces of peanuts is approximately 10 grams. Going further, if we're working on liquid materials, okay, for the volume, 5 ml or 5 ml is 1 teaspoon, okay? This knowledge comes very, very useful for me, okay? Because um, commonly, like in the farm, they really don't have access on the syringe or the droppers, what they have would be something that they can use from their household. And that's your teaspoon or that's your tablespoon. Okay, so that's why it's good to know the capacity of a teaspoon. Okay, if it's liquid, that's 5 ml. If it's solid, that's 5 grams. Okay. And one tablespoon is 15 ml. Okay, or it carries 15 grams. And then one tablespoon is equivalent to 3 teaspoon, okay, because 5 times 3, 15, okay, and that's it. So these uh, common units of measurements are from the UNFAO publication that was released in the 1980s, okay, that's why you still see that it's color black and white, okay, for the cups, so commonly we have these small cups that we can see uh, in the far-flung areas, okay, they don't have much big cups there. And I can remember when I was young, okay, um, we have, like when I visit my, my grandparents, not in the city, okay, they have more of these small cups, okay, rather than the bigger cups. And one cup would be approximately one-fourth liter, okay, or 16 tablespoons, and two cups would be equivalent to one pint or half a liter, and then four small cups would be approximately one quart or approximately one liter, okay? These are all approximation because, again, we are not using the uh, more accurate weighing scales for this. And at least it we can arrive at um, a good uh, measurement, okay, rather than not measuring at all. For the drinking glass, okay, also I have good memories on this small drinking glass. Um, I grew up where we were buying this local brand of peanut butter that has um, its glass bottle with several uh, decorations. And then we would recycle this glass bottle and use them as our drinking glass, okay? after we consume the peanut butter. Okay, that's approximately 237 ml. And um, one small Coke, and that's not the sacto size, okay? We now have the sacto size. But during the 1980s, that what we call the eight ounce, okay? Eight ounce, that's approximately 237 mils or 237 milliliters, okay? And during the 1980s, 1990s, these are... Um, we have only as much as one liter of the soda, okay? And I can remember uh, for a limited period of time, they have released a 750 millimeters capacity of uh, Coke or soda, okay? For the 320, uh, that's uh, probably like your gas bottle for your mayonnaise. And your 375, that's probably for... Uh, your glass bottle for your ketchup, okay? For your um, other type of condiments. Now we go to the different uh, ways to process your herbal medicine, okay? Let's play a game. At uh, first, I'll be showing you the picture and then you're gonna guess what type of process this is, okay? I'm going to describe the picture. First, you're going to prepare boiling water. Then you're going to put in your material and subject it to the heat for quite some time. And then you filter it. 
Okay? So what do you think is the name of this process? Okay, we'll see if your answer is correct. That is decoction, okay? The, um, the secret into doing the decoction properly is to boil your water first, okay? And then put in your material, subject it to active heat, okay? That's the main difference of decoction. We use active heat for 15 to 20 minutes and you don't cover your pot, okay? You don't cover your pot, you let it aerates, especially if you are dealing with um, plants with toxins, like let's say cassava, so you have to aerate it so you don't have to cover it. After boiling, you let it stay for some time, so when you use it, it's not too cold anymore. Um, you can uh, do two batches, and you can expect uh, a little more of the active ingredients that can be taken on the second batch, but still you can use the first batch, okay? I usually do decoction when I have mange patients. I uh, boil madre de cacao leaves, okay? And after doing the two batches, I would not really throw away the extracted leaves, okay? I would still scrub them off the, the body of the patient, okay? And um, the thing with decoction, you cannot really store them for a long period of time, not unless you use the natural preservatives, okay? As it is, it can only last for one day, okay, for the magic de cacao. So that's why if you're going to revert into the natural way of treating mange, you have to prepare uh, it daily or like if you have to do it every three days, you have to uh, do it again and again, okay, fresh decoction as much as possible. Otherwise, after 24 hours, there would be a stale odor, you know, it's not good, it would have a different color, okay? And uh, it's not good to use to your patient anymore. Okay, next picture. We have a separate separate uh, boy container for the boiling water. And then we put the boiling water in the pot. Let it stay for the same 15 and 20 minutes. And then we filter it, okay? Or we save it. What do you think is the practical application that you may be doing on a daily basis, especially when you are uh, living in your dormitories before? Or even now, I don't know, okay? What's the practical application of this type of process? Okay, so you can use this with um, instant noodles, okay? That's the same concept, instant noodles. Or you're with, with cooking your pancit canton, okay? So the name of the process is infusion, okay? There are two kinds of infusion. You have the hot and then the cold. Commonly, we use the cold. I would say the hot infusion. i sorry, commonly we use the hot, okay? It becomes more uh, efficient because it takes a certain time for you to subject your material into the hot infusion for you to extract the active ingredients, okay? And then um, for cold infusion, you would let the material be in uh, the water for 24 hours. And you can actually expect that uh, you can get more active ingredients from the hot infusion than more from the cold infusion, okay? Next, what would be the product, okay, the end product coming out of this process? What would be the end product? Do you see that the picture, there's someone grinding and then sieving or filtering and you see smaller particles. So the name of the product is what we call a powder, okay, so it's found and ground dried plant materials. So for the powder to uh, be, uh, I mean, for, for the powder to come out good, your plant material should be dry, properly dried at first, okay? It's difficult to 
grind them when they're fresh, okay? When the moisture is still high because they would be clumped all together, okay? When they are dried, uh, they would not... Um, uh, they would be separate from each other. So then you can sieve them properly or filter them better, okay? Okay, how about this one? What's the end product out of this process? So the first step is, again, grinding the plant material. And then with the use of a cheese cloth, you would squeeze this out. Okay, so I think this one is easy. The end product is what we call juice, okay? Of course, we cannot um, get any juice if our sample material is dry. So for this time, we have to have them as fresh plant materials. And then we um, try to grind them or we use the mortar and pesto and we squeeze out the juice out of it, okay? And this cannot be done in all of the plants, okay? Only certain types of plants, like the turmeric, okay? You can do this with the turmeric. Next one, what is the medicinal product out of this process? So again, we're trying to grind or pound the plant material and we put in oil, okay? What's this? Now we call this the poultice or paste, okay? It is a moist semi-solid preparation applied directly on the skin. So that's for our skin infections, different skin ailments. One I have mentioned earlier was the acapulco poultice or paste, which is very, very widely used now. And um, we have a leeway in using either fresh or dry plant materials for this. But in my experience, it would be better to use the dry plant material so they mix well with the mineral oil, okay? Um, it's better to, to mix powdered form that are very, very fine, okay? They would come out really well uh, as uh, for your paste, okay? Rather than having to use fresh materials. So aside from mineral oil, okay, you can use molasses or honey. But for water, uh, I would not advise this because when, we eat, when the water dries up, okay, your paste will disintegrate. So it's better to use oil and honey is also known to have antibacterial properties. So you are like hitting two birds with one stone if you're going to use the one with honey for your skin infections, skin wounds. Next, so it's a uh, preparation of the uh, plant materials through pounding or grinding again. And then this time you use honey, okay? You use honey for your carrier and you make, you form it as like circle or oval materials. So what we call the end product? Okay, we call this the bolus. So we can use fresh or dried plant materials for this, but then again, I would advise you see more of the dried because the mold um, is easily more formed or it gets easily formed when you use dried plant materials already in the fine powdered form and you put in honey. Because of the sweet taste of the honey or the molasses, they would easily eat it, okay? They would like it. Acceptance is very high. So in my experience, um, honey is, of course, more expensive than using molasses. But uh, if you are using the real good honey, so it's uh, it binds the plant materials better, okay, rather than the molasses, okay, because the molasses is kind of watery. So sometimes after a few minutes, okay, the boluses made out of molasses would disintegrate, okay? Now we proceed to the last part. That would be on the application of the herbal medicine. We have, um, for the decoction, for the infusion, we can give them as drench to our animals. So if you're going to use them on the piglets, they can, we can use the syringes without the needles, okay? 
and the restraint would be as such as we are seeing here. Then we also have a recycled cement container, okay, to be used as like a feed, a feeding bottle for our growers. Then we can also use empty glass bottles for our more mature pigs, okay. And this would be the manual restraint, you can see, in order to give the, uh, we call this the supak, okay, or give the decoction or infusion orally. Another way would be to tie up the snout of the sow, of the sow okay, and then do it or give the, the drench, okay, on the side of the mouth. So I would commonly tie the snout, okay, rather than having to manually restrain the animal like this one. Okay, it's better for them to be upright, okay, standing on all fours and giving this drenches so that none of the liquid would go straight to their trachea, okay, to their uh, respiratory system. Second application would be for force feeding. So if we have our boluses, so we can force feed our animals. We can have small boluses for our poultry and the bigger ones for our other animals, such as ruminants. Okay. We can also have topical application. Okay, we can have the paste, such as the acapulco paste or poultice. Or uh, we can also have this uh, madre de cacao, as what I mentioned earlier in one of my patients. It was a dog, okay, he has a severe mange. So we were scrubbing um, the madre de cacao leaves to the patient. Other than poultice, we also have fomentation or compress. And the difference of the two would be fomentation would uh, need to be uh, wet, okay, warm or moist sub substance such as a wet cloth that we apply on the parts of the body of the patients. And then the compress would be dry. So uh, we have uh, boiling water and then we use the vapor to... Uh, prepare the compress, okay? And similarly, the heat, okay, would be needed out of the dry cloth to be applied on the different parts of the body of the patient. Number four is nasal application. So this is not uh, widely done anymore, especially if you have um, large ruminants, of course, they would uh, have the cloth over their head as a hindrance. They would not like it, okay? But the concept is the same. And you would hear it now for our COVID uh, patients, no? they would try to liquefy whatever plug nose that they have with the vapor coming from um, this decoction okay, uh, or infusion, inhaling the vapor. Okay? The fifth one would be vaginal application. So we call this drug tessery, okay? The, the way to, to make it is like a bolus, uh, but we, to have a form like this one, we are using the syringe needle. Uh, we modify it, okay, so that we can have uh, preparations of pellet like as this one. So in order to apply this pessary, we put it in the um, vagina, okay, vagina up to the cervical area of the animal. So it's not possible to really put this inside the uterus if the cervix is closed. So at least the pessary will be absorbed in there, okay? Um, there are actually already a few commercial pessaries, okay, with antibiotics. So you may see them in, in, in your nearby uh, stores. Uh, but so then we can use, you know, um, uh, several herbal plants with, high antibacterial properties, okay, one example is the guava, uh, to be used for metritis cases, okay? Okay, going back to apply this, okay, we have to keep our nails and ensure that they are clean, and we have to use a lubricant, okay, in our fingers so it can easily go inside the reproductive system, and then we leave the pessary inside, and then we take our hand out. Okay. If we are dealing with liquid form to treat metritis, we can either use decoction or infusion, and we use or recycle the AI catheter and then 
we put in the infusion or decoction inside the semen bottle, okay? And it's like doing AI. So that's uh, basically the, the concept. We also use this for ruminants. If you don't have access with this commercial AI catheter, we can use papaya stock. Okay, um, just make sure that the tips would not be sharp and you still have to lubricate the end so it's easy to insert it inside the reproductive tract of the patient. Okay. Next is inner application. So if we have the vaginal application as pessary, we call the anal application. Okay, the product that we put in is the suppository. Okay, and this is quite famous, especially when we were kids. No, I am sure. Uh, no, I'm not really sure. But for me, I have experience, no, having received a suppository when I was a kid because I had difficulty in um uh, excreting my feces, no. So I had contact constipation. So I went through this, no, I received a suppository when I was young. So it's similar. And um, to prepare the suppository is the same as preparing your bolus. As mentioned earlier, preparing the pessary in the suppository is the same. So the application will just be different because the suppository is for the anus, okay? So you can use this for constipated patients and also for delivering uh, herbal plants with high antibacterial properties for diarrhea patients. Okay, number seven, we have the, the um, ocular application. Okay, so either we, we can use rice straw, sorghum straw, medicine dropper or plastic dropper for this. Okay, so um, we can have, you know, inflammation of the eyes, red eyes. So we can use Let's say makabuhay for that, okay? And next, we have fumigation. This is now controversial here in the Philippines because we have a DENR Air Clean Air Act, okay? Uh, but I'm sure that in, in uh, far from areas or in the mountains, some would still do this. And it's actually a common practice before wherein we would be... Um, fumigating okay fumigating plants okay and aerate the the barns or the houses of our animals to ward off uh mosquitoes and then flies so we commonly use this before or do this before before uh, <coughs> <coughs> during the rainy season okay or before the rainy season to ward off uh mosquitoes of course we have dengue then we have um, um, the tip here is to use fly repellent or insect repellent leaves. So we have citronella, um, we have um, eucalyptus and neem leaves for that. And this is just a summary of how we can uh, do or apply the different medicinal plants for feeding or we can uh, use this uh, aerosol spray like a disinfectant type of infusion or decoction. We, we can give off um, this infusion or decoction uh, for, for their um, daily water intake. And at the bottom here, we have leaves of uh, madre de cacao. Oh, yeah, madre de cacao. And uh, this would be good as an insect repellent for the uh for the the insects that would pester the nest of poultry okay they don't like the smell okay that's why they refrain from going near nests with this magic de cacao leaves okay so that's uh, another way to apply ethno veterinary medicine okay um now uh, we can have um up we can apply also this um, herbal plants with the use of a spray. And um, we actually have access to a few of the commercially prepared herbal medicines already, okay? There's a brand that we call it Topicure. And I'm sure you know, you've heard of it, <coughs> Himalayan brands, okay? They use um, several, several plants, okay? The extracts of several plants 
uh, to use as an immune booster, to use for uh, liver protectant or uh, kidney protectant, okay? And um, the ways to dispense could either be in a pig doser, like just like this one, or as you have seen earlier, the way we put in uh, the infusion for treatment of the metritis is through the commercial AI catheter and then also a lavage catheter like as this one, okay? So this is just um, the previous seat work or assignment that I have subjected my students to work into preparing the different kinds of boluses. And uh, the summary of our workshop for that particular semester was only castor oil plant was not readily taken by the uh, ship, okay? And all the other boluses were readily taken, so they were good. So we tried to taste castor plant and it was bitter. So even with the use of molasses and honey, it was not good enough to cover the bitter taste of the castor oil plant. 